Okay, hello and welcome to this Hive webinar. Thanks very much for joining us this afternoon. Um, my name is Petra Morris and I'm here from Cooperatives UK. Um, if you're just joining us for this webinar, you'll see on your screen, hopefully, that we've just popped a little poll there. Um, so before we start doing introductions and, and getting into the presentations, um, I'd be grateful if you could just complete the poll um, and that will give us an idea of who's online and, and what your interests are um, and uh, where you're up to in your journey, potentially of, of becoming a platform cooperative. Um, so I don't know how many we've got online at the moment and um, people might still be joining us, so bear with us. Um, so while, while you're just doing that, that, that poll, um, I think um, we'll just wait to see who's, who's answered. Um, it looks like there's some still joining us. Um, so if you're still joining us, say, please do take a minute to just complete the poll. Um, and then we'll share the results of that. Um, I think there's, there's more to join. So I'll just give it a few more minutes if that's okay. Um, so while you're doing that, I'll just do um, a quick introduction of who I am and why we're doing this, this webinar today. Uh, my name is Petra Morris. I work for Cooperatives UK. We're based in Manchester, but we cover the whole of the country and we support um, co cooperatives um, and we're a membership organization. And we, this Hive webinar is part of a series of Hive webinars that we're delivering. Um, so there'll be others going into the new year that you can also attend. Um, and it's delivered as part of our Hive business support program, which is funded in partnership with the Cooperative Bank. We're delighted that they have supported us over the last six years, um, and we've supported over a thousand cooperatives during that time. Um, so I'll shortly be introducing our speakers today. We've got a great line of speakers, including my colleague, who will be talking about platform cooperatives, as well as a couple of cooperatives that we have supported um, and our existing platform cooperatives. So um, I think there's people still answering the poll as they're coming in. So thank you for that, for um, just completing that poll. Um, and we'll, we'll share the results of that in, in a moment. Um, and then I'll start introducing um, our speakers. Um, in terms of housekeeping, this is a webinar. We are recording. Um, it does mean as a webinar that you can't share your pictures, your camera, um, and, and we have muted everyone. Um, while we have the presentations, please take the time to use the chat at the bottom. Hopefully everyone's familiar now with Zoom and they know how to post questions in the chat. Um, and then we'll try and answer those questions, um, hopefully at the, um, before the end of the session, um, if not in, in the chat itself. Um, as well as the presentations on platform cooperatives, we'll also share um, where you can get further support if you are looking to set up either a platform cooperative or a cooperative more generally. So I hope that's all right. Um, I don't know if any more are joining us. Um, so I think we can end the poll now and uh, share the results um, and see um, what, what that gives us. Um, so, if, um, so I think, um, so that's, that kind of says to me that um, not many people know very much about platform cooperatives and hence you joined us today. So that's good to know. Um, and hopefully you'll have a better understanding after the presentations today. Um, and um, yeah, um, so that, that's kind of what we were expecting in terms of um, the uh, results. So there might still be others joining us, but um, I think we'll we'll get started and I'll introduce our first speaker. Um, so if we can stop sharing those results, if that's okay, please. And close that call. Okay, so um, thanks for, again for joining us. So I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker. Um, Vika is, um, Rogers works with me at Cooperatives UK. Um, she's our program manager on one of our programs called Unfound. Um, and we've been working very closely via the High Business Support Program to um, support new platform cooperatives. Um, so Vika is going to um, hopefully give you an overview of what they are um, and also will tell you a little bit more about um, what support might be available um, towards the end. So um, over to you, Vika. Thanks very much. 
Thank you. Thank you, Petra. Thank you, everyone, for filling in the poll. It's really useful just for us to have an understanding of like who attends these webinars and, and how we can shape them to, to support you uh, in the best way. Um, so yes, my name is Vika Rogers. I work for Cooperatives UK. I'm a program manager for New Co-op Ventures, and I run the program called Unfound, which is a program set up to facilitate the development of the platform cooperative sector in the UK. It's delivered by us at Cooperatives UK in partnership with Stir to Action, uh, which is a very interesting organisation that organises trainings and has a quarterly magazine on the democratic economy, and is supported by the Cooperative Bank. Um, we do a variety of activities, but our main focus is providing business support to platform co-ops, but we also do work around awareness raising, trying to channel funding towards platform co-ops and some work on, around policy. But before we dive into platform co-ops, um, I just wanted to sort of start from what we understand, what we define as a platform business, so that we're just sort of like on the same page as we move through the presentation. Um, there's no specific definition of what a platform business is. There are lots of different words that are used to describe it. I've just put together this definition because I find it useful uh, and useful for, for sort of framing what platform co-ops are. Uh, but a platform business is a business that uses a digital platform to trade, connect people and or pool resources and data. And what we've seen in the past decade is really the rise of these type of businesses and the rise of the so-called platform economy. And the, you know, digital platforms are sort of penetrating all aspects of our life, often making it much easier for us to do things, be it order food, meet uh, friends, connect with loved ones, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but unfortunately, um, there, there are also a lot of quite negative consequences that are being generated by, by these platforms. So I'm sure you're aware of most of them, but I've just summarized some of the main issues in the next slides. Um, so data is becoming more and more a crucial you know, topic of debate and data ethics, et cetera. And unfortunately, you know, currently platforms collect and hold large amounts of user data and do not always disclose how, what they do with it or do not necessarily use ethical practices. Um, they often have algorithms that contain bias that might skew the way the platforms operate. And um, they're very centralized as well. And this means both uh, a lot of control in society due to how much data they control and how much profits they, they're making and how big these corporations are becoming, but also control on the users themselves uh, to the point that you know, they can deactivate an account from one day to the other, effectively firing uh, workers. Um, they're so they're they're really undermining some base, basic worker rights and they're facilitating dependency on precarious income streams and working conditions um, and have been fighting quite hard against uh, any form of collective actions. Um, they've also, you know, in some cases really created problems for local communities. Airbnb is a typical example of this, how uh, local communities have really suffered from the expansion of Airbnb. But also something that I think isn't said enough is the success of these companies is really based on uh, very, you know, the problems that we have in our society. And so they wouldn't be so successful if unemployment rates weren't high, if there wasn't such high inequality. Um, and they have really benefit from both the financial crisis and the current COVID crisis. They have ex exponentially really grown in the last two years and it's really horrifying. Um, and, you know, Many of us think that it's it's there's very much is tied to their business model um, that is e extracted in, in nature. So it's based on the fact of like extracting disproportionate value from other people's assets and labor while offering limited rights or even value in return. But that this is also driven by their financing model. So many of these platforms are funded by uh, venture capital. Uh, that expects very high returns and expects um, a seat at the table and control over the organization as well. And so to maximize profits and growth for VC funded funders, there's a tendency to, to, create, to create either national or global monopolies by destroying uh, competition or buying it up, and also very aggressive lobbying of governments and, or attempts to anticipate and circumvent regulation. 
So this is all quite scary and horrifying, <laughs> I know. Um, but one of the points that you know we make in the platform co-op movement is is asking the question is it really the technology that's the root cause of these problems or if we change the business model would that actually solve some of the problems or keep in check some of these problems so what if platforms were collectively owned and democratically controlled what kind of businesses and platforms would we see emerge what would we see you know how would delivery be run if it was actually run and controlled by its writers how would spotify uh, run if it was controlled and run by musicians or listeners how would airbnb run if it was actually reinvesting in its local community and what's really exciting is that the cooperative movement is providing alternatives to to these models we have co-op cycle that is a, a platform co-op for writers we have resonate which is a platform co-op owned by musicians and listeners we have Fair B&B, which is a platform co-op for, um, uh, for a travel uh, rental uh, that reinvests any surplus in, in the community. So it's really exciting to see that we can do things in a different way. But let's dive a bit more deeper into what platform co-ops are. So basically, if we use you know, a similar definition to the one that I started with, a platform co-op is a democratically owned and controlled business that uses an online platform or a mobile app to trade, connect people and or pull resources and data. This is really quite broad and we can you know, think of a lot of different types of businesses that could be part of this. But the main point is that platform co-ops operate according to cooperative principles and values. And what I find interesting is that you know, this can impact both, this impacts both the business model but also can impact the way that we use technology and data. I'm not going to go into detail of all the principles. Um, you know, there's lots of information on our website and other webinars where you can find out more. But I hope that just like reading through the principles, you can see how how this can really impact the way we build um, digital businesses. The other thing that I find really interesting is like how can we harness the power of technology that has allowed the existing platforms to to be so successful for co-ops um, and what can we learn from that so you know one of the main you know aspects of these platforms is that they eliminate the middlemen and so there's a direct connection between uh, people or between businesses and people or between uh, or business to business and there's really something value, value in that that we can build from um, there's a real push for autonomy both in how we, um, you know, workers, how many hours we want to work, how we want to be contracted, but also as users and the possibility to choose between different services. Technology allows people to collectively participate uh, more easily in democratic decisions and the barriers to access to certain services can be re reduced. Also, technology allows us, because of the easy access and, and the way the internet works, to, to grow businesses um, more easily because of the network effect. And though platform co-ops do have you know, high startup co costs, they're not astronomical compared to, if we compare them to other businesses that aim to scale rapidly. And so you can actually start, start with quite, um, you know, without needing large assets. Obviously, as you want to grow, you need you need more and more finance, etc. But to start off, you can start experimenting immediately without needing to earn large assets. So I think there's extreme potential uh, in this model. Um, so let's start with some examples, and it's great. You know, we've got Signalize here, who's going to talk a bit more of their experience later. Um, here I've put like four platform cards that really focus on this relationship between the providers and receivers of a service and eliminating the, the middleman. Um, in some cases, both providers and receivers become members of the cooperative, and it's really part of the purpose of the, of the cooperatives to sort of work on, on this re these relationships and, and um, uh, transforming the power dynamics between the relationships. Others are set up as a worker co-op. So in the case of Red, uh, Red Brick Language School, which is an online school for English teachers, for now it's set up as a worker co-op because they have a much more transitional 
uh, interaction with students that you know might take on courses for one or two years maximum, but the, the relationship doesn't continue over time. Um, so yeah, it's very interesting how not only it's changing the business model, but also the dynamics and the power relations between the providers and receivers of a service. There, I've put these other three examples to describe also a different type of model of platform co-op. And I'll start with Open Food Network and Co-op Cycle. And it's great. We've also got Kay here from Open Food Network. So we'll hear more about uh, their experience. Um, but in the case of Open Food Network and Co-op Cycle, what I find really interesting is that the platform provides an infrastructure for more traditional cooperative businesses. And so in the case of Co-op Cycle, you have a platform that then local groups in different countries just set up their local worker co-op that uses that platform. In Open Food Network, it connects existing businesses. They might be co-ops, they might not be co-ops, but it really shows how the internet technology can support also existing and more traditional forms of, uh, of cooperatives. And I think that that's really powerful. And finally, COCARS is another type, I would say. It's where uh, so COCARS is um, a, a basically a platform for hiring electric cars, and it's really an example where a community comes together, buys some assets, electric cars for their community, and then the platform is what allows the community to manage that resource between them. Um, and I, I'm expecting we're going to see more and more of these, uh, maybe even in, in the energy sector, for example, but also um, a new sort of space that is developing that we don't have really examples in the UK is how this could work around data, for example. And we can go more in detail in that if anyone's interested in the Q&A. Um, so hopefully I still have a little bit more time just to tell you like how, you know, how we've seen platform co-ops um, being set up. So this is really sort of observing how things have happened. And also I'll give you a bit more guidance on how, where and how you can find support. Um, so this is mapping on, mapping the journey of a platform co-op startup on the sort of more traditional startup language, uh, which is actually changing really rapidly. So I wouldn't get too stuck on these pre-seed and seed words because it's just changing very rap rapidly. But the main point that I want to get across is like, I've tried to divide the stages up into three stages. So there's a lot of work that goes in even before you incorporate. And I call this the setup phase. And this is when you're testing your business case, you're finding your team, um, you're working out, is a co-op right for me? Which is the most appropriate structure? There's, so you know, this might take at least a year um, unless, you know, you, you're someone, you're, you've already got a team and you can move really rapidly. Um, there's uh, and maybe actually, um, Jen, if you haven't done so that yet, because I can't see the chat, there's a, there's a link to a more detailed sort of uh, founder journey of what, everything that's contained in these steps. Um, after incorporation is when you can start finally attracting funding and you can start trading. What we see in this phase is not necessarily a final version of the platform, but a lot of experimentation going on and trying out with prototypes, understanding what do our members need? What do our new users need? How should we you know, modify the business model and, uh, and business plan around what we're learning as we're going through this? Um, within one or two years usually, but you know, this will change immensely from platform co to platform co -op. There's usually a phase in which a platform co-op decides that it's the moment to grow, that they're really ready to launch, or they might actually need funding to develop the platform to a stage that they feel that they can launch it more publicly. Um, and so they will uh, uh, look for external funding. And then there's, so there's then a phase and depending on the type of the co-op, it might decide to grow sort of in a slow, sustainable way, or it might decide to, to want to scale really rapidly because if they don't, uh, take a part of the market, then the, the business won't be able to su sustain itself over the long term. Um, and if we look at like funding, so before you incorporate, you can't really accept grants as an organization. So what we've seen is that um, platform co-ops have been able to obtain, for example, founder grant grants, so grant grants that are just for the individual who's exploring a pioneer idea, for example, or we also encourage um, to use crowdfunding. It's not, you don't do crowdfunding for the money. 
and you get very little money, but it's a really important step to start testing your business case, uh, identifying is there, if there are people out there that believe in your idea, who are going to be you know, your potential users. Um, so it forces you to define your purpose. So there's, it's, more, it's not really necessary about how much you raise, but all the learning that comes from that. Once you incorporate, we've seen um, platform co-ops raise in the first year, even before they have a, a, a functioning uh, platform, around 75, 80k, uh, 80,000 k. Um, and when you're thinking of this, um, if you're a platform co-op founder, it's very unlikely that you'll find grant funders that will fund you just because you're a platform co-op. We're not really at the stage that grant funders are like, oh yeah, platform co-ops are the solution to everything. So my advice is really think about your sector and, and the grant funders that are allowed aligned with your purpose and approach them. And as part of your mission, you're also describing why your governance structure has you know, an important role in, in defining and making sure you deliver on your mission. Uh, but it's not enough just to say you're a co-op. Um, and then year one or two, when, when co-ops you know, have a team that they're ready to launch a share offer, they've got um, you know, clarity on, on what they need the money for, et cetera. We've seen um, on average sort of around 300, them raising around 350, 375,000 um, in community shares, which I'll talk a, a little bit about. So you can see how the equity, which is a form of equity investment. So you can see how that creates a real jump um, in the form of, of financing. This doesn't mean that you shouldn't keep on looking for grants as well um, in, the, in the following years. Um, so this is um, just a chart for anyone who really likes numbers, uh, but I, I just wanted to share just a few of the details. Um, so community shares are a very specific type of equity that is used in cooperatives by cooperatives. I'm not gonna go into the details of how they work, but I provide some links um, uh, for further information. Um, but <coughs> just to give you a sense of how much has been raised up to now, uh, there's been a total of around 3 million investment in platform co-ops from the community, but also from institutional investors um, who match the amount of funds raised from the community. And on average, we've seen uh, uh, share offers of around 373K. Um, the first to really use this form of capital, so this capital is mainly used for local businesses, uh, lo sorry, local communities reclaiming local assets, for example, be a community hall, a community cinema, uh, but is slowly being adopted also by platform co-ops. The first to really adopt it were media co-ops that were already operating as a, as a worker co-op. Um, so, for example, New Internationalist, Positive News, and decided then to transition to a model in which they in included their, their membership as part of the cooperative. It was then followed by, by co-ops like Sinalize and Equal Care in the care sector. And, uh, and then more recently, we've seen uh, one of the biggest raises was with CoCars that they raised around 600k uh, in community shares. Um, so just to conclude, um, I'll just go through a bit of the support that is available for platform co-ops. Let me just check on time. Um, so we are about to announce a new accelerator program that will be uh, running next year from April to June. Um, the accelerator program is a business support program of 10 weeks uh, for a cohort of up to eight to 12 teams that are really at that early stage of setting up their platform co-op. So really before they incorporate, or maybe they've just incorporated and they really need support in setting the foundations of their business. Uh, and it ends with a pitch event uh, where towards which the cooperative bank has contributed a 10,000 pound prize fund. Um, uh, so yeah, it's just really for teams at the start of their journey and that are looking that, that are looking to register in the UK by the end of, of next year. Um, deadlines. So the 6th of March is the deadline for applications and the accelerator, as I said, will run from April to June. And here are just a few links for uh, the um, I, I think if Jen, if you could paste some of these links into the in the into the chat. 
Uh, there's more information about the accelerator. We'll be running webinars about the accelerator on the 18th of January and the 15th of February. Do register to our newsletter. Um, there should be a link in the chat for that. And uh, you know, that's where we communicate about any, any news, any events, any programs that we're launching. Um, and do visit our website where you'll find much more details about the founder journey, how to finance your platform co-op and case studies. Um, but also more broadly, and Petra might um, refer to this again at the end of the, of the webinar, do visit our, our Co-ops UK website more broadly where we have a step-to-step -step tool that can really help you through the stages of like what you need before incorporation. Um, and also explore the other support programs that we have that are not necessarily specifically tailored for platform co-ops, but can support you in some aspects of developing your business. So the Hive, which is um, you know, promoting these webinars, can provide up to 10 days of bespoke one, uh, uh, business support. We have an advice team that can provide support in a lot of different areas. And we also run a lot of training sessions. So do visit our website for that. And do visit also the Community Shares Unit, where though it's, more specific, it's not specific to platform co-ops, you can find out a lot more detail about how community shares work. Um, and yeah. And finally, um, it's not only us at Cooptives UK working on platform co-ops, there's an amazing international network uh, of platform co-ops. We've just had a conference in, uh, in November in Berlin. All the videos will be online shortly. Uh, so do visit platform.coop is the website. Uh, the, pla the Platform Cooperative Consortium, which is run from the New School in New York, uh, also runs an international course once a year called Platform Co-op Now course. That is really good, especially for uh, researchers, I would say, because it really gives a good framing of, uh, of, of what platform co-ops are. And then there are a lot of, there are a few international lists uh, that it's really worth being on. Um, and that's it. These are my contact details if anyone needs to get in touch. And I'll hand it over to Petra. Thank you. Thanks very much, Vika. That's um, a really great overview of platform cooperatives. And it's exciting to see the alternatives that we already have set up um, and um, you know some of those platform cooperatives that are already in existence. And I'll shortly introduce our first couple of speakers um, who can talk from their own experience of setting up their own cooperatives. Um, and it was great to see as well that there's lots of support there for anyone who's looking at starting their journey to be a platform cooperative, including the Accelerator course. Um, we've posted lots of links in, in the chat. Um, I haven't seen too many questions yet, so I'm, I'm, I guess you're all holding on to um, your questions at the end in, in, in the chat. But I did, I did pick up a quick question, and I don't know if there's a quick answer to this, Vika, if you want to do that now. But I think somebody asked um, when you were talking about funders and, and match funding um, and institutions funding community shares, um, someone asked what type of institutions generally have funded when, when and so I don't know if there's a quick answer to that or whether you want to hold that onto that um, to, to the end, but that's one question I did pick up. Um, Should we, uh, maybe I'll answer at the end. Of okay, the that's fine, then answer. we can. <laughs> okay, but does it, obviously people were listening, so that's good. <laughs> um, so without further ado then, um, I'll introduce our um, first, uh, second speaker of, of this session, um, Jen Smith um, is the founder member of, of Sinalize. Um, she's also the business and development manager of Sinalize. Um, I've, I've been delighted to work with Jen over the last, I don't know how long it's been now, but we were able to support Sinalize through the High Business Port Programme and I think also through Unfound. So it's great to have um, a, an example of a platform cooperative that's been on this journey. Um, and Sinalize, as we said, mentioned before, they're there for deaf interpreters and also the community they serve. Um, and then a great example of, of an alternative co-op model to what generally is happening out there. So I'll, I'll hand over to Jen and, and hopefully she can share her slides and, and talk to you about her experience. So thank you, Jen. Thank you, Petra. Good morning. Every I'm sorry. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Jen Smith from Signalize Co-op. So let's just find... 
my slides. Can everyone see that okay? Um, so as Petra mentioned, we're a, a multi-stakeholder cooperative of sign language interpreters and deaf users. So we have actually three user groups. We have our investor members from the community share offer um, as well. And this is sort of sums up why we were set up because this is the kind of story that happens about one to, once or twice a month in the community where um, an interpreter isn't provided and the family have to step in, which is actually against the NHS accessible information standards that are in place. And this is a shocking, and these are the stories that get in the media. Quite often there are more, more stories out there that we just don't hear. Now, there are many reasons for these stories happening. And um, usually it's to do with many of the reasons that Vic has already stated that agencies are acting as the middlemen quite often with no knowledge um, of the community, or it could be that the staff just don't know how to book. There's quite frequently the contracts change hands and it's quite difficult to communicate with um, frontline staff about who they should be calling to book an interpreter. And there's also one of the biggest problems is a complete disconnect from the deaf community. So quite often the, the deaf, the deaf person who has an appointment might not know whether an interpreter has been booked on that day or not, which causes quite a lot of um, worry for the deaf user. And um, one of the reports was, that's really important is the Sign Health Sick of It report, which says uh, this actually causes a lot of a loss of value for the public sector when interpreters aren't provided. Because if you then have go on to have misdiagnosis or, or poor treatments, it actually costs quite a lot of money. So that's that's the background to why we were set up. Um, so my background is um, actually as an interpreter of 16 years, having seen these issues on the front line and also having deaf family members seeing that from a user point of view and being part of interpreter organisations where everybody's talking about the same thing being a problem. So our ethos and what we offer is that we're the experts in delivery because we are the end users and the end suppliers. They are our user groups. And also we are bringing specialist knowledge. There are other specialist providers out there, but we're the most direct form of specialist knowledge, if you like, because we're a community owned business as a cooperative. And we have that built in access to our communities via our um, membership meetings. So we had a recent one on Monday with our communication professionals, our interpreters. So we have this constant consultation with the community so that we can find out exactly what's going on on the ground. Um, so this is just a brief overview of our journey. So around about March 2019, which I think was when I met, first met you, Petra, on one of the workshops that Co-ops UK had run, where I was sort I knew that the co-op was probably the answer to some of the issues that we were having, but I wasn't exactly sure about, you know, even reading through all of the wonderful resources on Co-ops UK, I think I needed to be in that face-to-face -face meeting with Petra or, or a webinar online to actually get a grip on what we could do. And I think I came away from that workshop with about 10 pages of notes and actions about what we had to do afterwards. So I got together a couple of um, other interpreters that I knew understood that and would all been part of the union. My colleagues set that up. So we'd been, we'd been reading documents um, for, for public sector tenders for years before, before that and picking out the holes in the lack of standards around interpreting and what um, perhaps private businesses were allowed to get away with because the standards weren't there. And we've been doing a lot of rep representation to central and local government and statutory organisations about this. So moving on a couple of months, we applied for the Hive pretty much straight away um, and got lots of support from Co-ops UK. That was absolutely fundamental in our journey. I think that put us on a real springboard to development. And then we quickly got some other funds that, that of the type that Vika had mentioned um, for, say, pioneers, somebody with an idea or a group of people with an idea. So we very quickly got some financing in place, incorporated with the FCA, a sign code.io, which looking back at it is a terrible name, and I hold my hands up for that. And um, we then very quickly around the start of the pandemic launched a crowdfunder and at the time we were like who who launches a crowdfunder at the start of a pandemic it was crazy but we'd been planning it for months so we just had to roll with it and luckily that was and as, again as we has said part of that was actually about raising our profile and not about the money that we received but also the money that we received was really fundamental in paying for some of the earlier business costs that we had um and then rolling on to june 2020 we rebranded 
And then September 2020, um, around about then, we did the community shares launch, which took a long time um, to prepare for. Um, so it wasn't an easy thing to do by any stretch, but it's put us in a really good place now. Um, and then we had a really big win in August 2021, which where we gained a place as a sole supplier on a very large NHS framework in Merseyside, where the whole of the cooperative um, membership is based. And that has been a, an absolutely phenomenal success, which we wouldn't have been able to do, I don't believe, without having done the community shares raise, because that has brought in the working capital that we needed to show um, that we can be a viable business and also um, raised our profile immensely to show what we actually meant business. We were here to stay and we knew what we were doing and we were the experts in delivery. And that's just completely set us apart from um, other people in the market. I have left, I'm not going to talk too much about this slide, but I wanted to leave it in just because I think that we're now part of the post-COVID economy. And I think part of the reason for getting a place on that framework is we really stood out. We've been told the feedback that we had from the commissioners is that we stood out in comparison to anybody else because of our USP as not just being the experts in delivery, but the way that we were a community business. And we were lucky that that particular procurement exercise had quite a high, um, it placed quite a lot of importance on social value. And had because of that in the tender, I think that's why we really shone through. Um, and I think that some of the changes that we're now seeing um, and that have been in place for a while to do with public services, social value, local commissioning guidelines, we're really trying to piggy on, piggyback on, on that and try to be the alternative that's out there in the market. So for us, it's being in the right place at the right time. And COVID's actually, as much as it probably set us back by three to six months in our development at the time, it's also brought a lot of positivity and I think we're on quite a rapid um, trajectory of growth now because of it. So how do we compete with everybody else that's out there? Sign language interpreting is an incredibly um, competitive market with a lot of big players. A lot of the people that have the contracts out there are actually spoken language businesses that have tacked on sign language. And that's where we come in saying, but your, your, your providers are not experts in what they're doing. And this is why the deaf community are suffering and interpreters aren't getting paid sustainable fees. So we compete by being the alternative, by being the specialist, but also by being community owned um, and, and putting ourselves as an opposite, as an alternative to the gig economy platforms. Um, so I was just going to talk a little bit about where to start um, with all of this. And I think for us, it was about I've, I've talked to a lot of founders and we've been part of um, some social entrepreneur programs and business programs. I've talked to a lot of startups over the last two years. Um, what we've found is that we had the right people right at the very start to push us forward. Um, I think had a, it have just been one or two people doing it, it would have been much more difficult and a much slower um, way of growing the business, but also finding our USP and our market segment. I mean, the majority of this is normal business planning, um, but our governance model, it was vital for us to be a, a multi-stakeholder model rather than a worker cooperative. Um, and that's just that just reflects how much the community we feel that the community needs to be involved as end users and how they can be involved because they're actually accessible to us. And then um, I think when we started looking back at it, we were doing quite a lot with things like Google spreadsheets and just we just got started. And and in fact, looking back at it, we probably could have started earlier, but we wanted to get more things in place. Um, and then we just got the business, um, the business basics in place, such as insurance, our communications and the website. And our existing landing page is actually been tweaked from the very first landing page that we have. And we've actually got a platform in beta at the moment that's not really publicly available. And that's still being piloted um, at the moment, along with a video uh, relay service or a video interpreting service. So um, the other thing that we did was we got users, users involved quite early on in the process, especially because there's tech involved. And looking back, there, is, there, were, there were a couple of things that we probably, well, we did get, I hold my hand up, we did get wrong because we didn't have the opportunity to validate. And part of that was around not having access to um, NHS 
uh, staff on the front line and asking how they might book interpreters. I think we validated a lot with the deaf community. We validated a lot with our interpreting users as well. But we, it was very difficult because around that time, it was also the start of the pandemic. And obviously the whole of the NHS went into crisis mode. So we'd, we were on the verge of trying to approach people and then we just had to go, we can't do this right now. The NHS is not in a place where they're going to want to talk to us. So we didn't, we didn't have a chance to validate some of our assumptions, which we're having to go back a bit on now. But that, it's not the end of the world. I think some of the, some of the assumptions that we did make were luckily right. And the others that we're fixing now. Um, so that's just a sneak preview. Not many people get to see that, but that's the interpreters on the platform. Um, I hope they don't mind me showing you. Um, we, we haven't onboarded the entire interpreting community because I think there's still some reticence about the tech and what people are going to be able to see or not. So uh, we're on we're on a quite a long journey of working with especially the deaf community, actually, because there's a lot of digital exclusion and we're doing a few outreach events and it's shocking you know, we, we, we had eight new deaf um, user members the other day from an outreach session that we did, and five of them don't have email addresses. So that's a particular subsection of the community, but that's something that we have to be really mindful of about how we gain, because this what you're seeing is the, the view of the interpreters, but for deaf people, they can also log on to the platform and state there, because you can see the hearts there, they can state who their preferred interpreters are or not. And what we're trying to do is get deaf people onboarded onto the platform so that we use that information in the bookings process. And that's quite difficult to do at the moment, also with the pandemic. So we're on quite a long term journey with some of the platform and some of the parts of the tech and reaching um, the deaf users, but also on the interpreting side, working with people who don't want to be on the platform and finding out why and doing a lot of reassurance. Um, so what deaf users get when they have an appointment is they get a text message saying who their interpreter is on the day with a link to their profile. And um, we had some really good feedback over the last couple of months since we started the NHS contracts and started um, trialing all of this, where deaf people, interpreters would arrive and the deaf person would say, oh, I knew it was you coming. Look, I can see your face on my phone. And, you know, like with a little preview and the interpreter going, oh, that's brilliant. And how did you how did you get that? And then the deaf person going, I don't know. I think the GP sent it to me and the interpreter having to say, no, 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 it was signalised. <laughs> so we've had some really nice moments some really nice feedback and nobody in the country does that or takes the time to do it. So this is the value. The primary value at the moment of the platform is that level of communication with deaf users and the interpreters and having visibility of deaf users likes and dislikes as well. Um, so that's that. So what's next for us? Basically, we need to keep testing the platform, keep adding features and functionality. We've also got the video service in the pilot phase. Um, we are trialing that with some GP practices. We, we believe that several GPs are now trying to move their appointments from face to face to um, telephone appointments. So this is where the video service is gonna come into play over the next couple of months. So we'll see if the take up increases um, with the deaf community and also the NHS. Um, and then we need to do more outreach and community work. If anyone knows of any funding out there for, for that kind of thing, please do let me know because we need to fund that first. We also want to really increase our membership, which is difficult in the time of a pandemic as well. And this is more on the deaf user side, but we're doing, we're starting that kind of work now. Um, we're also recruiting for more administrators to do more of the background work. And what we need to do is gain even more contracts um, and increase the amount of business that we do. And just keep investing in the platform and tech, which is what the community shares um, funding has been able, the community shares raise has enabled us to do. So we're, we're, we're talking to several developers at the moment and doing a lot of background work on that. So that's where we're at in our journey, two years on. And that's what we're doing and that's how to contact us and I'm happy to answer any questions later thank you very much that's great Jen and I hadn't realized it was all the way back in 2019 that we first were able to help you through COPS UK and the high business support program so it's great to see how much progress you've made in that time and one thing you never mentioned um, you didn't mention was how great you are on social media and and uh, you know if you want to see how how to do it well, um, Jen's the person to speak to. Um, and I also heard, you know, how much difference it made to 
the procurement and, and getting your contract of being a cooperative. And it's really, you know, positive to hear that that that, that, that was a USP for you. So that's really positive. So um, I'm just aware of the time and I don't want to lose that time for our, our last speaker in this session. Um, so I'm delighted to introduce um, our next um, platform cooperative. Um, so Kay Reed is going to talk to you about their um, cooperative called the Open Food Network, um, which allows um, food growers and food retail to essentially get to their customers more effectively through, through that platform. So um, hopefully while I'm speaking, Kay's got her slides up and is ready to go. Um, and so we will uh, listen to Kay. Thanks very much for joining us. And then hopefully there'll be some questions and some time at the end to ask, answer and ask questions. So thanks very much, Kay. Awesome, thank you, and thanks for inviting us to, to come and share today. Um, so I'm Kay, and I'm a member of the Open Food Network uh, UK admin team. Um, I have joined the team about two years ago, so I don't, I, I wouldn't really give the kind of founders journey justice, I'm afraid. So I can say that um, we were founded by two uh, members of the OFN admin team, um, Lynn Davis and Nick Weir, and they were part of the grassroots food movement, so they very much kind of our OFN has kind of blossomed from, from the food movement. Um, and we're also a global collaboration, uh, building open source software and resources to support community food enterprises. The software we create um, supports innovations in food systems that enable producers and communities to create food systems that serve them. So essentially we're a, a co-op of cooperatives. And so our goal has always been that the community of food enterprises using the Open Food Network are co-owners, designers and creators of the platform. And we work with food enterprises that are, uh, that are driven by communities uh, who have social and ecological values at the core of what they do. And we help these food enterprises to grow online um, and coordinate regionally and also to streamline their admin and processes. So our vision is for an interconnected food system um, of food enterprises which exist and thrive in a food economy which is much more diverse, vibrant and inclusive, celebrating both provenance and culture. And we want to see improved markets for ecologically produced food to encourage more producers to adopt ecologically sustainable food producing practices, building topsoil and uh, biodiversity in our ecosystem. And we also want healthy communities where community food enterprises, producers and local institutions collaborate together uh, to enable communities to have better access to better food. And we do this through our easy to use software platform, um, which offers online shop fronts to our users and um, with lots of tools and features that help them to run their community food enterprise and just make the whole process a lot more easy for them. And we also um, offer uh, lots of learning resources. Um, that's one of the kind of major uh, benefits of what we do is that we don't just offer the software platform, but also like a wealth of different resources and, and knowledge and expertise that is shared um, among our members. And that's where some of the work that I've been doing kind of fits in. So I've been helping food enterprises with their marketing um, and also kind of facilitating events and webinars so that food enterprises can get to know each other and the members can get to know each other and share their own expertise and learn from each other so that we're stronger together. And some of the benefits for having, um, for running a platform, um, a platform as a cooperative, is that what we do and what we create is grown from the real needs of food hubs and farmers across the UK and globally. And particularly through COVID, it really showed how vital digital infrastructure can be. Um, but without the cooperative economy, the gains are private. So um, one of the main benefits of, of running um, the OFN this way is that all of the all of the benefits and all of the gains are then kind of plugged back into the community. So the community benefits from, from our successes. And also building software with social aims is difficult to fund. And our funding model works by spreading the costs and building the collective. Um, and we pool our funds globally uh, to pay for our software uh, delivery team. So just a little bit about the OFN um, UK admin team. So we had our first gathering together face to face because we're a completely remote working organization a couple of weeks ago. Um, so we're still kind of in the process of uh, collaborating together of how, uh, how, how we run things in, in the UK. And so some of the, the, the ethos um, that we have as a team is that we're non-hierarchical. We operate as a sociocracy. Um, that means that all of our decision making is made by consent. 
and we operate um, with kind of complete transparency. So um, Buck isn't kind of done in silos. We um, really kind of foster each member of the team or of the um, community to have as much knowledge as possible about the different things going on with the community. Um, so I've got anything else in my notes that I wanted to say. And also just that our team massively expanded during COVID. Um, so that's why over the last couple of years, we've been looking, um, collaborating much more together as a team of how, of how we operate together. So that's been a really exciting process for us. So that's kind of all I have really prepared um, for my slides today, but I, I'm open for questions in the Q&A, but here's all the different ways you can um, get to know more about us. And I also wanna say we're also recruiting at the moment as well for, for some new positions within our, within our team. So I might share a link in the chat if that's okay, just to our recruitment page so you can see um, what opportunities are, uh, opportunities are available with the OFN team. And also we're always looking for, um, for new food enterprises to, uh, to join our community, so. That's great, great, Kay. That was, um, uh, sorry, sorry, yeah. Um, that, thanks so much for that, Kay. Um, a great overview, a very quick overview of what you do. Um, I didn't catch how, how long has the Open Food Network been, been um, running now as a cooperative? As a cooperative, I think it started as a, as a kind of a cooperative in Australia. So it's been running globally for quite a long time. But in the UK, I think since 2015 was when, okay. uh, and also one of our um, food enterprises, um, Tema Valley Food Hub, so um, also, uh, started um, the OFN together in 2015, I think. That's great. Thanks so much, Kay, for joining us today and giving you that, giving us that overview. That was really helpful. Um, so we've seen, um, we've heard today from um, Vika's gave, given us an overview of what platform cooperatives are, and Jen has talked about to her, um, is it signalize or signalize, whatever they want to be called, <laughs> um, cooperative and, and the Open Food Network. Um, I think there was a couple of questions in, in the chat. Um, we still have a few more minutes left before the end of the session, so I'll pick those up now. So I think one of the questions I'd already uh, mentioned to Vika was around institutional um, funding um, for platform cooperatives. So um, Vika, do you want to pick that up? Yeah, more than happy to. Um, so you can find from our website, you can, and from some of the links we posted in the chat, I, I referenced the Community Shares Unit. Um, the Community Shares Unit also runs a, a booster fund, which provides uh, both grant funding for people who want to do a community share issue and match funding um, uh, in the form of institutional investment. However, um, this is really tailored to businesses that are place-based. Um, so it's not really uh, tailored, you know, for, for, for platform co-ops. Uh, so it's not sort of like necessarily granted that you, that you can access that type of funding. Um, but I would definitely explore the website. And also if you're looking for support on how to, to do a community share offer, it's really the place to go. Um, but what I would say is uh, we're really interested in connecting with grant funders that could potentially uh, invest in community shares with platform co-ops. Um, so, you know, if you start having conversations with grant funders and you need uh, our support and sort of like, how do we uh, translate community shares in a way that a grant funder will understand it, et cetera, you know, do, do get in touch. Um, we're looking to identify what type of what grant funders would be interested in, in, in providing in institutional investment. But again, I think at this stage of the development of the sector, it's very sector specific rather than just, oh, it's a platform co-op uh, business. What I am going to paste in the chat is um, this is two years old, unfortunately, but I did do some work two years ago on mapping out the tech good, for good funders. Um, so I'm going to put this is a public document that we've shared before, so I'm just going to put that in the chat and it's just a, a spreadsheet with a list of like potential uh, tech for good funders that you can use. Yeah, thanks for that. Vika. If I can just add that through our community shares booster program that Cooperatives UK, we ourselves are in, institutional investors and we've match funded quite a lot of um, community share offers and, and societies out there. So. Um, and I know quite often, particularly when it's linked to assets, that quite often local authorities have, have um, been institutional investors in those share offers. 
Um, so I think there was also a general question, I don't know whether to pick it up here on, on the Preston model. I did put a link in, in, the, in the chat if you want to find out more, um, but I think the Preston model is really around, around community wealth building and better procurement, and it's backed by Preston City Council, um, and we've been working with the council over the years to you know, put cooperatives on, on the agenda as a, as a um, better model for delivery of certain services, particularly in the community. So, but there is, there is a link in, in, in the chat and I'm happy to um, pick that up um, outside of this webinar if, if anyone wants to know more about that. Um, I think there was a question for Jen specifically on, on um, signalise and I guess around your governance and decision-making, is, is, is that right? Um, I, I think I saw that. Um, that's probably not a quick and easy question to answer in, in this session, um, I imagine, but I don't know if you want to say anything at this point about that, Jen. Yeah, we use we use um, consensus decision make. Well, we use so sociocracy um, for our decision making in meetings. We haven't yet come across a big vote that we had an issue with where there were different sets of views. We've taken votes at general members meetings. We also have our deaf members meetings and our communication professional or interpreters meetings. Um, our voting is as a multi-stakeholder cooperative is 45% weighting to interpreters, 45% weighting to deaf users and 10% to investor members. We haven't had an issue yet where there was a vote where the, there was um, where we had to calculate weighting or there was an issue with a disagreement yet. So we haven't come across that yet at all. Um, I don't foresee that we, I think we're all quite well aligned in what we're doing at the moment. So I think that's why we haven't had any issues yet. But if we do, then we have that voting criteria that we can use. And it's probably worth mentioning that Cooperatives UK, the kind of support and advice we give um, is often around governance and, and you know, we have training um, and lots of resources to help cooperatives to think about that. Um, it, it, it takes a little bit more thinking about, but when it works, it, it makes the cooperative more successful. So, um, but that, that's kind of where our area of expertise is at Cooperatives UK. Um, and it is support that we can also provide to existing cooperatives through the Higher Business Support Programme. Um, so I don't know if there's any other questions. Uh, we have a couple more minutes left. Um, to check if we've missed anything. Um, I think there was um, a comment from somebody, I think, based in, in Canada. So it's nice to know we're going out internationally. Um, that's uh, great to hear that there's participants um, internationally. Um, just, yeah, so, um, and I think Vika did um, mention that there's lots happening around the world around this area, not just in, in the UK. So we are part of that wider community. So, um, so welcome all the way from, from across the water. So thank you for attending today. Um, so if and any last questions or observations from our speakers or anything else that I've missed, um, if anyone wants to prompt me. Um, so, um, so I'll just just um, close close the webinar at this point just to mention again that we have recorded it. Um, we will make it available online and we'll share the link with everyone that's registered um, after the session. Um, we have more webinars coming up. I will be delivering a webinar um, in a couple of weeks' time, which is more general about um, cooperatives and how to start them, not specific to platform cooperatives. Um, and there'll be some in the new year as well. Um, and um, you'll see on the screen that we have our main website at Cooperatives UK with lots of information about how to start your cooperative and the different funded programs that are available. So. Um, do um, pop along to that page. Um, and as I say, I, I manage the high business support program, so I would be your point of contact for any queries around that. And Vika would be your point of contact for Unfound and anything to do with platform cooperatives. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our speakers. Um, thanks very much for joining us today. Um, I hope everybody found this a, a really great introduction and overview. Um, and I hope you're um, in, inspired to take the next step and come back to us um, if you have more, more support questions or, or we can help you on, on your journey. Um, so we'll, we'll finish it there. Thanks very much. <laughs>